Welcome to Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, editor-at-large of CBSMoneyWatch.com, and I'm joined by... Jack Otter, executive editor of CBS Money Watch. And live via Skype, we also have our editor-in-chief. Say hi, editor-in-chief. Hey, that's me. That's you. Uh, hi, everyone. Eric Schoenberg. And we also have our Money Watch blogger, Steve Vernon. He writes Money for Life. And, you know, Steve, we had to bring on to the program because we needed a, a real number cruncher for this one. Because this is the special Social Security episode of Ask the Experts. So we have Eric, who is the best opinionator about Social Security. But we also have Mr. Vernon here to make sure our math is right. Right, Eric? We, got it. we need someone to, like, make sure who, who can run an abacus for us. <laughs> There is, there is no way to know this stuff. You just have to be, I don't know, you ha must have it in your genes. I, good thing Steve that's right. So let me just give a little bit of uh, Steve's bio. Well, I don't know. He's really smart. That's, let's start with that. And he's a president of Rest of Life Communications. That's a firm producing trusted information and strategies to help people prepare for their retirement years. So, uh, But basically, you started your, your career as an actuary, right, Steve? That's right, Jill. Spent 35 years helping companies run their retirement programs and decided to do a new shift in life and help people with their retirement. Was that hard to do? I mean, do you feel like um, the, the shifting from like the corporate world to the real life, like on the ground, individual stuff, was that hard for you? It was easy uh, because I get people thanking me every day for what I do. And in the corporate world, you don't also almost get thanks that much. So, you know, so it's a lot of fun. And and we and really, Jack and I are here for dress like just sort of like, you know, extra. And to thank him. And to thank him. because <laughs> yeah. and Even because, though we work in the corporate world. That's right. Uh, and Eric, I was wondering if he wouldn't mind starting off and talking a little bit, bit about the blog posts that you put up that um, aroused basically the wrath of even friends of yours people who like you were mad at you so what happened what did you say in this blog post about social security that just torqued people off so much uh, well it was about the myths around social security a lot of people believe that uh, the program is going to go bankrupt uh, i don't think it will as long as there's political support for it it's it's going to be around but a lot of the anger is about this complicated mythical creature known as the Social Security Trust Fund. And either it exists and it's worth two trillion dollars invested in gold-plated U.S. Treasury bonds, or it's totally a figment of uh, some accountant's imagination and it won't help people at all pay for their retirement. Um, where you come down on that uh, seems to be a question of belief uh, and sort of passionate feeling as well. And so I'm one of the guys who believes that the Trust Fund is um, not totally a fiction, but in practical terms, it's not going to help pay for retirement all by itself. And that got a lot of people angry. And Jack, what, what do you... Whoa. Whoa, we're getting a little feedback there. Sorry about that. Jack, you were about to weigh in. Well, I think that the key point that Eric makes over and over again that people just are refusing to listen to is this idea that it's basically a pay-as-you-go system. People take money out of my paycheck and Eric's paycheck and Jill's paycheck and maybe Steve's, or he just writes a check to the government each year, and that money goes to current retirees. That's how it works. And if we want Social Security to continue to exist, then working people are going to have to continue to put money into that program. And and people will go after Eric for, for trying to spend the lockbox and so forth. Um, the lockbox doesn't exist. Uh, the money comes, it's a pay-as-you-go system. And Steve, how did the whole lock, I mean, before Al Gore said <laughs> lockbox, and I swear, I every time I see it, I think of like that Saturday Night Live skit where he's like, lockbox, lockbox, lockbox. But how did this mythology come to pass? Well, actually, the last time we had funding problems with Social Security was back in the 80s. In 1983, we had legislation which raised taxes and cut benefits. And at the time, they could foresee that we'd have funding issues with the baby boom generation. And so they started using terms like build up a trust fund, build up a reserve. And this is classic Social Security jargonese. <laughs> you know, they use words that have implications elsewhere. And they get you thinking that with Social Security, they have the same safety net. So when they started using, we're going to build up a reserve, a trust fund, there's this like Eric was saying, there's this money that's in theory accumulating, but it's really a bookkeeping entry. Right. And so the money really isn't there like it might be in your 401k plan. Right. And and of course, it's not, it's like saying that I'm going to, you know, I don't remember whoever wrote the book about buckets. Who is that guy? Who wrote the financial <laughs> book about like you've got your buckets of this, your buckets of that. But it's all one big bucket. It's your family's money. So it's the country's money. So I think that was the best point that Eric made, which was like, 
you know, it's it's not like these. Are, it's not like everything is distinct. We don't have that in this country. Actually, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, accounting shenanigans, which are perfectly mm-hmm. legal that we do, right? Well, um, yes, and I like to think that Social Security is just one of many programs the government runs. And the taxes that they collect from Social Security, that's just one of many taxes they collect. And it's all one big system that they're taking taxes in various ways. And they've got all kinds of programs they have to spend money on. And so you just can't think of Social Security in isolation. It's part of what our big government is running. Well, uh, let's go to a few questions. And by the way, if you've got a question, you can certainly email us, ask the experts at moneywatch.com. You can also go to moneywatch.com and hop into the chat room, and we'll be monitoring that and making sure that uh, – I'll actually have to make sure it's up on my screen because last time I forgot. Um, and uh, let me just start with a sort of a general question from Dale, and a number of people ask this question. Is Social Security going to be around in 25 years – or will the system die out due to mismanagement by the government? Eric, Social Security going to be here in 25 years? Yes, it will be. It will be. Social Security will be here as long as workers are willing to pay benefits to older people. Just like Jack said, it's a pay-as-you-go system. And as long as taxpayers are willing to pay the taxes, there will be checks for retirees. The question of mismanagement by the government doesn't really have to do with that. That all has to do with this mythical trust fund that that, uh, we have been talking about, I have to say that to to call it mismanagement is kind of a, uh, it's a misconception. What happened was, was that baby, uh, that the baby boomers' parents had too many kids and the baby boomers had too few. This is a system. Well, that is mismanagement. You know, the Chinese, they they, like have a way to manage the way the births and now come on, we really messed this up. You see, that's how we did it. One way, Jane Bryant Quinn, our, our great blogger, does, once described Social Security as a saving system in which you deposit children. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, Steve, it's going to be here in 25 years. You believe that is the case? You agree with Eric? I believe as long as we have a democracy, we will have Social Security in some way, shape, or form. Oh, okay. Well, that's, and Jack, you're in? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing with either of these guys. Forget <laughs> it. I'm done. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and it was occurring to me that another reason that we have this myth is because this discussion of privatizing Social Security and people used 401k and pension analogies and talked about investing the money. But it's not as if my money is going to pay me later. It's my son's money that's going to pay that's me. That's right. That's right. And, and Jill, let me actually add a story. I went back and looked at some of my writing 10, 15, 20 years ago. And Back then, I was cynical. The Social Security would never be there. And I think this is also maybe a generational thing. When you're in your 20s and 30s, you know, it's just so far away that, and you just, you get cynical about it. And I was cynical about it in my 20s and 30s. Now that I got close to it, I see how it works. If we have democracy, we're going to have Social Security in some way. Well, Noel asks that, uh, it says he, he's 25 years until retirement. But here's the question. But when I get those Social Security statements in the mail, I'm not sure if the estimated amount shown is the amount I should expect to get at retirement age or if that amount will be adjusted for inflation 25 years from now. So we all get those Social Security statements. I think we're only get, we're not going to get them as often now. Um, it was once a year, but I thought they were talking about maybe that was too expensive to do that. So is that the right number? Is that today's dollars? Yes, Jill, it's in today's dollars, and that's so it can make sense to you. You can kind of budget with it. With it. But in reality, your benefit will be adjusted um, for wage inflation up until you retire and then for CPI afterwards. And it's just that if you showed a wage projection or a CPI projection, and right now it looked like you're getting a gazillion dollars. Woo-hoo! Yeah, Security. rock on. I don't have to save anything in my 401k. Psych. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So, all right. There was another. Leslie, I was asked one of those like, whether she's going to get. This is funny. See, this is a, this is Eric. This is you're the kind of person who is going to write a nasty comment. Just wondering if when I turn 62 or 65, will there ever be any left of what I have paid in for over 20 years? Well, you know, come on, answer that for me. In the early days of Social Security, uh, the program made a deliberate attempt to make people think that it was a pension. It, as Steve said, it borrowed the language of pensions. It it led people to believe that they their their taxes were were contributions to a pension account. So people were led to feel like it's their money. Uh, FDR, in fact, said, as long as we call these taxes contributions, no one can ever take away Social Security. But in reality, it is a pay-as-you-go system. It's just another transfer tax. And you have to think of it as, you know, just part of the federal budget. It will be there as long as people, taxpayers, support it. Uh, It has nothing to do with how much money is accumulating in some so-called trust fund. So... What Steve said, 
when, uh, when he said as long as there's a democracy, he's right. As long as the beneficiaries of Social Security are, are voting, the system will be there. And, and I think that we have a lot of problems around people, people's confusion about when to take Social Security, because there's a lot of choices here. And um, so let's get into some of these more, just more direct questions and that we can talk about this. And then maybe at the end, we'll save a little bit of time for how we might um, sort of shore up the Social Security system, some of the ways that, that things that have been discussed and what we all think is probably the most likely scenario going forward, given that we did not do a good enough job having children. We did not have enough children. Um, okay, here's one from Lydia. How does Social Security work when a married couple reaches retirement? Both have paid Social Security during their working years. Do each of them receive a check from their individual accounts? There's that mo- problem, their <laughs> individual accounts. What individual account? You don't have an account. Or do they receive only from one account? Are both accounts combined and paid out to the couple? What happens to the money in the account if it's not used? Jack, this is an easy one. I'm going to give you a little layup here. Oh, okay. Well, Steve is going to get into some complicated strategies these guys can use to maximize their payout. I'm going to let him take it. I will simply say, yes, you will get separate checks. Um, But the trick is that if one of you is paid a lot more than the other, you might want to actually take the lower uh, wage payer's benefit at first to maximize the high earner's pay out once he or she hit 70, right? And, and then go take you. Well, so but the basic theory here is that you can take your ba- own based on your own wage or half of your your working spouse's wage, uh, Social Security, right? Right. Whatever's bigger. And Jack, you're absolutely right. Actually, a common strategy for married couples is is to have the higher wage earner. Usually that's the man in today's society, you have to admit. Um, and usually men marry women that are younger than them. And, you know, men live shorter than women do. And so What happens is that when the first one dies, which is usually the man, then the benefit for the widow, for the survivor, would jump up to what the man was getting. Exactly. You're not getting half at death. You're getting the the total benefit. Right. And so if the man, who, if in one case is the higher wage earner, if that person waited till 70 to get the maximum benefit, then when he passes away, his widow or his wife would jump up to that maximum benefit. And so that's a common strategy that I think people ought to think about. Right. So delay... Until 70. 70 is when you max out, right? That's right. the best you can do. But um, but at that point, what happens if, at, you know, he drops dead before them? It's like a little roll of dice, no? no. Well, yeah, although she'll get uh, his benefit again when he dropped dead or his right. full retirement benefits. So um, that's still protection there. Okay. That's good. Um, this is one from Libby in Greenville, South Carolina. I, I would read it with a Southern accent, but I would not sound good. <laughs> I, I don't look Southern. Uh, I have a friend who recently lost her husband um, due to sudden cardiac arrest. They were both 64. They both still worked. She went to the Social Security office to sign up to get the monthly survivor's check. If she takes this, she was told she may only earn $14,000 per year. Is this correct? Why would there be a limit on what she can earn? So now we have a little bit of a different issue, right? Right. And Jill, there's something called the the earnings test. And so really, Social Security was devised for people who aren't working. And so if you're working, they're not going to pay you a benefit. They do have a threshold, 14160 <laughs> And if you earn under that amount, you can get as much Social Security and, I mean, I'm sorry, as much wages with no reduction in Social Security. That rule applies to your full retirement age, which for most people right now is age 66. And at age 66, that rule goes away. So one answer to her is yes, she would get a reduction in her benefits if she started them at 64, but that reduction would only apply until she turns 66. And after that, there's no reduction for wages. So what I'd urge her to do, if she can wait, if she can afford to wait, wait till 66, her benefit will be bigger anyway which is a good thing for her. Right. And then after age 66, Jack, she can earn as much money as she wants, right? That's what you're going to do with Diane. You're going to like put her to work. (laughs) Jack's going to be sitting back and he's going to go fishing. He's like, honey, go to work and we'll, I'll cash all the checks, right? She says she cannot imagine retiring. So thank God. Thank God. More fish for me. Mm -hmm. Um, One point I want to say that, 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 that um, benefit you get at age 66, then you get that for the rest of your life. Right. And so by her waiting till 66, she's maximized or increased her lifetime benefit. Right. So there's a, that benefit for waiting as well. Yeah. Um, Eric, we have a lot of questions about waiting, taking Social Security early at age 62, where you can take it early, waiting till you're 66 or even waiting till you're 70. What would you suggest? General rule of thumb, Eric, for Eric Schoenberg's th- rule of thumb on Social Security. 
Eric Schoenberg's rule of thumb is to quote Steve Vernon's rule of thumb. <laughs> <laughs> and that, Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but these numbers have stuck with me. The magic numbers, remember, are 78 and 82. And generally, if you can stay, if you think, think you'll live past 78, then it pays to wait until your full retirement age. The extra money that you would get between 62 and 66, uh, you know, you, you haven't, you, you'll, the penalty that you'll pay by getting it early doesn't, uh, it, it means that if you live that long, you'll make it up. And 82 is the age at which it pays to wait until 70 to begin receiving benefits. I think you, I, I, correct me if those numbers are wrong, and maybe you can even state it better. Eric, you said it just fine. The only thing I'd refine is it's 82 and a half. Oh, <laughs> all right. That half a year kill you every yeah. time. <laughs> So, um, and and what, when you're talking to people, I mean, I think that it also makes sense to ask them, hey, you know, how's your health, right? Because you're going to play a game about life expectancy. And if you have some, you know, some illness that you have or is in your family or maybe there's mm -hmm. not such a great life expectancy, then you do tell people to take it early? Well, right. In fact, I tell people, um, do an estimation of your life expectancy. And there's some great online calculators that will do that for you. You'll take into account your lifestyle and your family history, and at least you can make a decision based on what's most likely to happen. We can't guarantee when we're going to pass on, but <laughs> at least let's try and do the best we can. Live to 100com is that one of them? That's living to 100com Living to 100. Uh, Bluezones.com is another one. Those are excellent things anyway for anybody planning their retirement. I highly recommend you go out and try those. Live to 100com I'm just going to make living sure I'm making to. Living to. Got it. And Jill, you will like this. I, I took that test, and just because I, I can't resist it, I played around with some of the variables. Yeah. And when I checked yes on moderate drinking, it gave me two extra years. Uncheck that, and it, it said I would die two years younger. So Really? Yeah. So it does pay to drink. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. I've been saying this for a long time. Yeah, heavy moderate, drinking? Not no, so good. Yeah. <laughs> not so good. Exactly. Um, we got a, like there's some detailed questions, so let me try to get get through. This is a long one, but I think it's kind of interesting. So James wants to know, um, would it be best when it would be best for for him and for his wife to start taking Social Security? James is 60, and she is three years younger. She's about to turn 58. They both have Social Security full retirement age, 66. They're healthy, but somewhat obese, relatively inactive, and honest. I know, right? No one ever says that. So I guess we both die a little younger than average. I'm a retired professor drawing 20% of my base income until age 65. Then my income will cease. My wife is a physician. He married a doctor <laughs> and plans to retire at 62 in about four years, during which time she'll earn about $260,000 a year. They've got a million and a half bucks in retirement accounts, three million total. They have long-term care insurance. She's going to take her federal benefits into retirement for life. What do you think about taking, when should he take it at 62? Should they delay? Should they wait? What do you think? Well, Jill, and this is one of these kinds of questions that has all kinds of moving parts to it. Yes. So I'm glad I got to study this before the radio show. Well, very good. <laughs> and so um, one thing, it depends on that 20000 per year that he said he was earning as mm -hmm. a retired professor is that wages, which sometimes it is as part of a retirement package, or is it a pension? Mm -hmm. That's a crucial difference because, as we heard from the previous listener, if it's wages, that will count as a reduction towards the Social Security benefits. Right. So if that, that uh, 20000 per year he's getting as a retired professor is wages, he should wait till 66. Right. If it's uh, a pension, then he could start at 62. Okay. Now, she's probably best off starting it at uh, either 66 or 70, um, depending on whether she will make that mag magic age that Eric just talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. If she's going to make it to 82 and a half, which is actually a good likelihood she will. Not if she's so. What do you mean if she's obese? Maybe not. Just, well, it depends on <laughs> She's how a healthy obese. obese? <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Okay. But, you know, most women are going to be living, I mean, the averages will put them into their late 80s. Right. And so even if she's a below average, you know, if she makes it to 82 and a half, that's a good chance. So mm -hmm. now, so I think she might benefit even by waiting till 70. Now, there's one little nuance I uh, want to point out is that if he starts his benefit, she could get a spouse's benefit when she turns 66. Right. And delay receiving her benefits so it grows to the full amount. So at 66, she can say, I'm going to take half of his and then switch at 70 and say my full benefit. Right. Sweet. Right. That's a sweet deal. 
and I'll throw in one very general point of view on these people. They're, they're obviously, they're pretty well set. She's got a good salary. They've got a lot of retirement savings. So my thinking might be, you know what, let's look at Social Security as a catastrophic insurance policy. Hmm. Wait till age 70. If there's a terrible market crash, and I don't know where he's invested, but maybe those retirement accounts go away. Maybe their house burns down. And then at 70, they'll have some real money. At the moment, it's really not going to move the needle too much for this guy to be taking his, 60, his age 62 benefits. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. My dad, he was um, he, he had like a pretty serious heart thing. So he thought he was going to beat the system and start taking Social Security early. And I had to tell him that he's getting closer to having made a bad trade. <laughs> I said, good news, you're alive. Bad news, you screwed yourself on the Social Security. So you're telling him he's got to die soon to that, make it a good I said move, you right? got three years. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a bad trade. Um, OK, this is interesting from Matt. He manages HR at a small nonprofit. Near fiscal year end, if we are under budget, we like to give a small bonus to our employees, 80% of whom are on social um, SSI or SSDI, so Social Security Disability. Bonuses are in the two to $300 range. How do bonuses affect the Social Security income and Social Security Disability income? What do you think? You know, I think uh, in this case, maybe paying it out as a bonus to the 401k plan might be a good way uh, for mm. those folks. Um, because then they'll have something for retirement and it may not affect their SSD or SSI. So that's good. So if you want to do a bonus or you want to do, you would have to have a 401k that could allow you to either do a small match or a profit sharing on attachment to it, right? Right. And most plans allow right. that. Right. That's what I figured. Okay. That's a good one. Um, okay. Here we go. Susan says, my husband passed away two years ago at the age of 65. He never retired, meaning he never filed for Social Security. He worked. He paid Social Security for 40 years. I am 58. When am I eligible for survivor benefits? Do we know this? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so she can collect benefits at earliest at her age 60. Um, okay, that's what I thought. But if she delays, it'll get bigger. And so if she delays till her full retirement age, which is probably 66, mm -hmm. she'll get the full benefit that he had earned. Yeah. At, at say, 60, she'll get 71.5% of that full benefit. So uh, if she's healthy and if she can afford to postpone delaying, postpone getting that benefit, that might be a smart move for her. Okay. Ron Ruff in the chat room says, what is the penalty per month to draw Social Security if you draw it between 65 and 66? The penalty per month, it would have to be based on your specific benefit, no? Yeah, and it's also based on, believe it or not, your age uh, and your, your birth. And so I just don't have that in front of me. Okay. Um, Donna wants to know, on a personal financial statement, is there a way to show the amount held in Social Security as an asset on the financial statement? Eric, can I do that? Can I, can I say, would, is it possible to do a present value? No. no. <laughs> you know, Congress can, Congress can take that money away at any time if it votes to lower benefits. Uh, so, no, unfortunately. She uh, can't put that $2 trillion on her personal financial yeah, statement. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, um, okay, let, let me just to the, this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's this guy who's a Dutch citizen. This is a little esoteric for me, but let's, uh, bring, let's bring it to the Tulip King right here. <laughs> um, my question is about the WEP. Does the WEP, could you please translate? Windfall Elimination Provision. Thank you. Do you want to explain what it is? Well, what that is, is um, there are some... Uh, employers that don't pay into the Social Security system, and the biggest example of that was federal government until recently. So um, if you have another pension from some other source and you weren't paying into Social Security, they don't want to give you the full Social Security benefit. It gets more complicated when you are covered by another system outside the United States. And so I can't answer his question with full details because I'd have to look and see the terms of the treaty between the U.S. and the Dutch and all that. But just a couple generalities I can say for him is that, first of all, is that um, the way the WEP or windfall elimination provision works is that there is a reduction to your Social Security benefit. And mm -hmm. it, that depends on how many years you paid in the system and a number of factors. But if he paid into Social Security for at least 30 years, our Social Security here, right. then there won't be a reduction in his pension. So I did notice in his question, he said a small pension from He has a Dutch. small pension, a Dutch citizen. So that was, I didn't read the rest of the yeah. question, but you, you jumped on it. That was good. Yeah. So it's small. Maybe that means most of his employment was here. That might save him. The other thing uh, that might help him is that the, the elimination or the reduction is only ha at most half of that pension. So ha his reduction in Social Security would be half of that small Dutch pension at most. Mm -hmm. So 
that's the best I can say without knowing more details right now. Hey, this is an interesting question. I just got it from Bobby. Just sent this. And if you have a question, you can always send this to ask the experts at moneywatch.com or go to moneywatch.com and you can go into the chat room and bob yes i think you do have to be re- you have to register and logged in to see it isn't that right victoria don't you have to be registered and logged in to actually see the chat room i think so anyway here comes bob he's 58 years old for most of my life all my income has been from investments not earned income so my social security contributions have been very little i would say that only between one hundred and one hundred fifty thousand dollars of earned income total for my lifetime to date that had social security contributions. So he's fifty eight years old. I'm the president of a small business. It's not making much money, and so I elect to pay myself an income and only to contribute to social security and increase my social security payments. Both myself and the company must contribute. So he's playing the game, which is I'm a small business owner. I'm going to take S corp dividends or you know distribute money through the LLC, and then I'm not going to pay into Social Security. So I'm so smart because I'm saving Social Security tax, right? Well, right. And see, that strategy sounded real good when he was in his <laughs> 30s and 40s yep. and 50s and uh, saving on taxes, and then now you're coming on retirement. Uh, this has happened a lot with small business owners, and I wish that we could get to them earlier and say, you know, it's worth paying Social Security taxes at least at some level. Right. Now, in his case, um, at least he would get a minimum amount from Social Security if he could pay into the system for at least 10 years. And so that's something to try and accomplish. Okay, so he's 58. So he is asking, he's saying that he estimates that if he wanted to retire between 62 and 65, he could make it up with part-time work. And he says, is it ever worth it to pay Social Security taxes only to increase my final retirement monthly Social Security benefits? I think in his case, yes, it's worth it. Because Social Security, it pays a lifetime pension no matter how long you live. And it's indexed for inflation. You know, that's a good thing. Right. And so I think if he could at least get to the minimum, which you need 10 years of paying into the system, then he would have a modest pension and it's going to be there for him. I mean, I think it's sort of a it's a good practice. I know it stinks to pay taxes, but it's also, by the way, if you think about also the the whole idea of paying, you know, sort of paying yourself with S-corp dividends, it's if you want to go out and buy a house now, mortgage lenders don't like that S-corp dividend. They want to see real wages. They want to see mm-hmm. that you're paying in. And so it, it, it does complicate your life a little bit. It does. You're right, though. It, does, it always seems very smart when you're 31. Well, <laughs> and and for those listeners who are in their 30s and 40s running their own businesses, I would advise them, you know, pay some kind of taxes into the system. You know, you can minimize them, but pay something in there and you'll get a good return back from it. Dean says he didn't file for benefits at age 66 last November. This November, he'll be 67. Any advantages of filing now? And will I suffer any penalties? They don't penalize you, Jack, if you wait. Well, it's yeah, it's not literally a penalty, but it's you won't get as much if you file at 67 as you do at 68 or 69 and at best at, at 70. So if he can keep on going without filing and he's healthy, as, as per Steve's rules, uh, then then I would hang on to it. I mean, really what you're buying is longevity insurance. Uh, if you find yourself living to 95 when a hamburger costs $55 or whatever it's going to be. Costs uh, you that right now, big shot. <laughs> you're going to be real glad that, um, that, that you waited and, and you have a larger benefit. Ah, uh, here's an interesting one. I always love these divorce questions with Social Security. It's like, oh, I, I hate you, but I love your Social Security, honey. <laughs> Here we go from Julia, who was married on March 3rd, 1972. Oh, yeah. What was the number one song in 1972, March 3rd? No. I, uh, I got a divorce finalized on March 2nd of 1982. I believe you have to be married 10 years to draw on an ex-spouse's Social Security. You know, I, I saw that and I went, oh, man. <laughs> uh, and a couple of thoughts. First of all, I don't know. I'd have to go and look at how they count years because... You know, technically, 365 days is a year, and maybe she did have those 10 years elapsed. But uh, the only other thing I can say is that if she worked for a fair amount of her life, chances are her benefit would be bigger than that half of his her ex. For that, for and you only get half of that for that 10-year period. No, is that, no, or, no. Or you get one. You get half of his you total. Get, you get half of his for the rest of your life. Okay. But if she's had substantial earnings throughout her career, her benefit would be bigger. And so if that's the case, she didn't miss anything. Oh, man. I, and she's pissed off at her, um, her, her divorce attorney. She's she mad. She should be. She should be is right. That's it true. does sound like 10 years to me, though, because if, if it was till March 3rd, that would be 10 years in a day. I think right. So, so I think she's sick. I think she's, I think she's okay. okay yeah. I think she just try to file anyway and see what happens. And Jill, Dare I, them. Uh, I've got an answer for you here. Yeah. Uh, Without You by yeah. Nielsen. 
I don't know who that is. Heart of Gold by Neil Young. Oh, thank God. As of March God. 18th. All right. So, yeah. you know, and she probably got married at a time where music was a little bit better than 1982 when she got divorced. So. Sure. All Heart right. of Gold. I, I like the sound of that. For All her right. That's, situation. Social, that's what Social Security has. When that's right. <laughs> um, let's get into how we're going to fix Social Security, because here's a question from Mike who says, what or where is the credibility of the United States government guarantee? This is sort of, I'm going to say with that anger, with a guarantee of a Social Security payout at retirement age if the government is running progressively increasing multi-trillion dollar deficits and if the U.S. defaults on its debt obligations does Social Security get affected? And it's your fault, Eric. Answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, the, the fact that we spend more than we take in will affect Social Security. You have to, as Steve said, you have to put it all in the same pot. It's all, all we've done in creating a Social Security Trust Fund is put money from one pocket into another. And we will have to have a conversation in this country about how much money we want to take out of workers' pockets and give to older people. Probably we still want to give a lot of money to seniors, but we ought to have that conversation in context of how much we owe to everybody else. And, um, so, and, and, and Eric, how, how – I mean, we, we talk about different – there are different ideas about this. Um, there is – Gail asks a question that if the system is going broke – why don't they take the cap off the income? All that does is benefit the highly compensated individual. Maybe they shouldn't tax the first 106000 Maybe it should be more than that. Should they tax some amount over that? Would that fix the problems? Would that fix the problems, Eric? It would help fix uh, a lot of the problem. And uh, the, question, uh, I, the question, I suppose, is, what benefits do you give people who make more than $106,000? Do so you freeze benefits at the maximum they now have, in which case you're taxing people and not, not giving them any commensurate benefits? There's a philosophical question there. If you do that, then you have destroyed the link between the amount you put in or the fact that you put in some money and, and the benefit you get out. And some people have a problem with that. But that is one solution, and, and uh, that and many other things are being considered. As to, fix the funding problems for the program. And Jack, is there some amount that, I mean, I had heard, and this is probably some very, you know, back of the envelope calculation, that if they had FICA taxes, your, you know, your Social Security taxes applied on the, the first 150000 rather than the first 106, that two-thirds at least of this problem of funding would be gone. I've heard that same statistic. I haven't delved into the numbers, but yeah, the the higher it goes, the more money you're getting. Over, I mean, the the bad news about Social Security is the numbers are so big and it's compounding over so many people over so long. But that's also the good news. So you add that forty four thousand dollars a year from every person making up to that threshold or more. That's a lot of money to be pumping in. I think that the only solution is going to, be, and then this is what, of course, this is the problem in this country is that everybody wants to get stuff and they don't want to give stuff and so the only solution is going to be to make small the smallish painful changes at every level so maybe we increase the retirement age a certain group is going to hate that we increase the threshold at which you keep on putting money into the system. Another group's going to hate that. Um, maybe we reduce the increase in the annual amount. And boy, you'll hear it on that. But that's the only way to solve these problems. So um, let's turn to our actuary to find out the right recipe. Fix it. Tell me what you want to do. <laughs> Fix it right now. Wave your actuarial wand and tell us what, you know, make a little kind of potion here. Raise, what should the wage base be? Well, uh, first of all, I'm going to agree with Jack in that it's going to be a, a mixture of different changes. Uh, I think taxing a higher wage is part of the mixture. Pushing back the retirement age is another part. Um, there's something that's kind of subtle right now is that your benefits are indexed for wage increases before you retire, and then it's indexed for CPI afterwards. And if they change that to be indexing for CPI before you retire, that would save a ton of money. And so I just think they're going to have to take a... a one oh, from here, and one All from right, there. well, what do you want to do? Come on. Like, put it out there, man. Let's oh. do what you want to do. Oh, Give me your plan so plan. we can fix it. That way we can just go to sleep tonight and really be able to rest. <laughs> and you can use Al Gore's accent if you like. My Ex plan. My plan uh. is a lockbox. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I had to say it once. Yeah. All right, so you put me on the spot, I'll say. I, I would raise the wage base probably to 200000 is where I'd go. Um, I'd increase the Social Security retirement age, probably to the late 60s, maybe even 70. Mm -hmm. um, I'd do the change in the indexing of benefits before retirement, like I talked about. 
Uh, if you did all those things, um, you'd bring the social security system into balance. Mm -hmm. Now, as that that goes a long way to solving the problem, but as Eric says, you still got a country that's running up tons of debt. And so, but well, um, we have other people to talk about with that stuff. Don't worry. Yeah, but I'd say, you know I'd say easier said than done. But part yeah. of the solution to fixing Social Security is to have a country that's feasible financially overall. When you look at it, countries that are broke can't afford retirement. Right. So we've got to be solvent as a country. And Eric, what do you want to do? You want to you want to give me your recipe for fixing it? You're just gonna we're just gonna all say like, yeah, Steve's right. <laughs> I'm not so wild about uh, raising the wage base for Social Security. I think we'll need to tax those people for other things. And remember, um, there are lots of Social Security, if you think of it as a closed system, isn't that hard to fix. It's the fact that there are a lot of other problems out there we want some of that money for. What I like is the one that Steve mentioned about changing the indexing for benefits because it's very subtle. It builds up over time so that people have plenty of time to, uh, you know, to prepare for it. So that's, I mean, that's the one I think is a shoe in. Why am I the only person, I mean, who I think we should raise the uh, retirement age? Because when the system was first created, uh, the life expectancy was so much shorter. I mean, the problem, of course, is that we don't know whether people can actually keep their jobs for that long. But still, I mean, we are living longer. Doesn't it make sense to say that, you know, that that 45-year-old woman should be expected to work till she's 70? I mean, it's just sort of seems silly to think 62. Well, and Jill, here's some little actual obscure fact Love here this. for you that supports your point, is that when Social Security was developed in the 1930s, 65 was the normal retirement age. And what would the normal retirement age be if it had always increased according to improvements in longevity? Mm -hmm. What would it be today? Well, that age would be 72. Aha! Uh -huh. So, um, you know, that's supporting your point. Is of course, we have 13 and a half million people out of work. So, I mean, those people can't work till they're 72. That is true. That's and a so problem. That's a problem. And the argument you see a lot is that people who are in manual labor jobs don't have that ability to keep on working as long as right, somebody in a desk right, job. Right, exactly. That is true. Well, and on that point, I thought there was a very interesting suggestion in the Debt Reduction Commission back in December, which actually was raising the, the retirement age except for certain disability situations like that. So actually, I like that. They were trying to raise the retirement age for most people, but being compassionate in, in situations where it called for having lower benef I mean, more benefits for disabled people. So that's an example of trying to balance common sense with compassion that we need to look for. Quick uh, ad for Simpson Bowles. I think they should just adopt it wholesale. What? Pain for everybody. I know, right? It'll kill Eric, us all Eric, and it'll solve do, the problem. You, you want to just take Sim you signing off on Simpson Bowles and saying we're done? Yes. Yeah, yes. I, shut up, I, everybody else. <laughs> broke my heart that the Gang of Six became the Gang of Five. Yeah. yeah. There's the bipartisan senators who were campaigning against Simpson Bowles adopted, and they they're starting to split up. Hated to see that. Yeah, I'm I'm a little worried about this. I mean, I think there'll be a debt ceiling deal. I I, I do think that they are they're not. I think that if they let us blow through the debt ceiling that that would be sort of bad for anybody in office and I think that mostly politicians don't really want to do good but they do want to get reelected so so I'm guessing that that's gonna happen but I agree it feels very disheartening to be at this place you have a pretty decent blueprint on the table everybody just sort of suck it up and say this stinks for everybody and 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 you know it seems to me um, so disingenuous when it's either one or the other. Well, no, it has to only be spending, and no, and no, it can only be taxes. It's craziness, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it, nobody would do that in their personal balance sheet, right? I'm not going to spend any money for the next three months. You do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no food, no shelter, no nothing. Kids, you're not going to have lunch. Sorry. Yeah. CBS, you know what? I don't want to be paid. You know what? The difference, of course, is that in a household, you can't just increase the intake. You know, like when you're the government, you can. You can tax people. You can't say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to make more money. But, and yet, when people are in a really tough situation, what do they do? They go out and they get a second job. Yeah, they hustle. Right? Or they, they do something extra. So I think it, it is, and, and they also cut back. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's common sense, and our government is incapable of exercising that. Well, and actually, just to build on that, the last time we had issues with Social Security, they fixed it at that time in the early 80s, and they did a combination of tax increases and benefit cuts, and it was about 50-50 in terms of the overall impact on that. And to me, that's what we should be looking at now. Yeah, and it's going to, you know, no matter what, it's like you said this before, Jack, everybody's going to have a pain point, and I get that in the United States, somehow or other, we always think like, yeah, I think that that pain is going to be hard for you. <laughs> like, I really, I'm sorry about your pain, but they don't want to say, you know, this is going to be painful for me too. Sure. So um, I'm, we're hopeful, 
We're I'm gonna say Steve Vernon for uh, Senate. Yeah, how absolutely. about that? Let's get him in there, <laughs> Eric. About, let's get him in how there. How about King? Czar. <laughs> czar. Yeah. I like a czar. You could be. You could be the number czar. Ooh, that's that scary. would be good. I'd <laughs> like that one. Hey, we're going to wrap it up right now. And so um, we want to thank everyone for participating here. Hey, check out Steve Vernon's uh, blog, which is he has a really good post up this Start Social Security Early and Invest. He has a little series called Ask the Actuary. You know, it's very crazy. It's sort of like, <laughs> I don't even know what I want to ask the actuary. It's exciting. I'll take personal questions next. All you know? right. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, that could increase your traffic. There you go. Uh, Jack Otter, as always. Great post today about Mark Haynes, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. It was awesome. It was about three lines, and then I took from CNBC. Why, but I them. why do you say that? Why can't you just say thank you? Uh, you know, my <laughs> wife says it to me all the time. I should just shut up and say thank you. Uh, God, it was great. Except, Eric Scherenberg, are you having fun in your undisclosed location? Uh, I'll disclose it. I'm in San Francisco. It's impossible not to have fun. Oh, here, my God. What's the weather? Uh, gorgeous. Oh, really? Hmm, it always rains when I'm there. Interesting. <laughs> Eric Scherenberg, editor-in-chief of MoneyWatch.com. Go check out his... What was the post called, Eric? The uh, Social Security post, which one... I can't remember the name of it now. Five Social, five social Security Myths That Gotta Go. Five Social Security Myths That Just Gotta Go. I love that. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. We did import you for this one from your state, your, your, your outside location. That's right. I'm from Southern California, but I'm here in New York City visiting my new granddaughter. Uh, <laughs> and what's her name? Jill. Claire. Claire Elizabeth Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for watching Ask the Experts. You can tune in next week at this time. You can always shoot us an email throughout the week. And if you've got a topic, or you want to do a special, sometimes we do a grab bag. Sometimes we do special topics. If you've got an idea for a special Ask the Experts episode, we are always happy to hear from you. That's Ask the Experts at MoneyWatch.com. I'm Jill Schlesinger. I'm Jack Otter. Say your name, Eric. There you go. You have been watching Ask the Experts, and we'll see you next week.